Greetings, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the organizer for inviting me to present and share some of the data we are doing in uh, my lab. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one of the Usher type 1 gene, Usher 1F, and some of the recent studies we have done from uh, in the human as well as in the mouse model. As you all know very well that Usher syndrome is a relatively rare disorder and depending upon the studies, the frequencies vary uh, from 1 to 4 per 100,000 in the US. And uh, almost all of the Usher subjects, they have hearing impairment, uh, sometimes congenital when it's Usher syndrome type 1, but uh, in other cases it's progressive. Uh, some of the affected individuals also have vestibular problem and then they have a progressive uh, vision loss which starts with normal vision in early part of life and with time it starts with the tunnel vision and uh, peripheral uh, blinding and leading to the legal blindness uh, uh, late in 40s or sometime in 50s again depending upon the type of the Usher syndrome. Clinically, as well as genetically, Usher syndrome is classified in uh, four different subtypes. Type 1 being the most heterogeneous and uh, severe form of the disease. Uh, genetically, it's divided into a number of different uh, uh, loci and the many no genes are known that contributes towards the phenotype. For today's presentation, I'm just going to focus on one of the gene which is responsible for Usher type 1F phenotype and the gene is called PCDH15 and it's encode a protein called protocadherin 15. PCDH15 is an uh, uh, interesting gene because it's uh, encode a protein with three alternately spliced cytoplasmic domain. It has a signal peptide at the end terminus. 11 cadherin repeats. These are the extracellular cadherin motifs that are involved in cell-to-cell -cell interaction, a single transmembrane domain, and three alternately spliced cytoplasmic domain we call CD1, CD2, CD3. There are a number of mutations and uh, I apologize for not having a most updated slide because there are over 100 different mutations reported uh, in the database for Usher syndrome type 1F in PCDA15. But uh, interestingly, there are many, many missense mutations also reported in the same gene that cause just the deafness with normal vision and normal function and what we call as DFNB23. Uh, among all these known, one particular variant, uh, R245X, it's a, a, a very common in a population uh, from Israel, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish population, and it has a carrier frequency of almost 2% in that population. This variant is uh, known to cause around 60% of the cases in Ashkenazi Jewish population for Usher syndrome type 1F. So my lab... Uh, particularly focused on this variant uh, both in human as well as uh, in the mouse model and our goal was to understand what is the natural progression of VN impairment in the subjects with this particular variant as well as if we can replicate the phenotype in a mouse model. So what I'm going to share uh, briefly is uh, a study we did in collaboration with investigators at National Eye Institutes and National Institute of Deafness and Communication Disorder, NIDCD, NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. In this study, uh, we enrolled, uh, we, it's a retrospective as well as prospective study in which the third uh, data, we, particularly the uh, VN impairment data, VN phenotype data from 13 subjects was mined. And these subjects has an age range of from 6 years to 67 years. 11 of these subjects were homozygous for this R245X variant and uh, two subjects were compound heterozygous for the two truncating allele of PCDH15. And the data mining site was NEI, NIH and NIDCD. So when we looked at the data, and it's uh, over 25 plus years, we mined the data from these subjects. And what we found is that uh, similar to many of the Usher uh, type 1 phenotypes, the progressive retinal degeneration was observed. And uh, when they are in subjects are in teenagers, then they have uh, molting of the pigmented epithelium, mild uh, attenuation of the retinal vasculature as well, but they have preserved uh, macular reflexes. With time, they start 
developing extensive pigmentation issues around the periphery of the retina. The, they have severe attenuation of the retinal vasculature. They started developing the macular atrophy and optic paler uh, nerve head was observed. And similarly, with age, uh, the phenotype becomes much severe, uh, advanced degeneration of the retina observed, uh, extensive pigmentation issues as well as macular degeneration was observed in these subjects. Uh, when we looked at, uh, there is a variability uh, uh, both uh, among the subjects with the same variant as well as between the eyes of the uh, same individual and this is just a representative data from one uh, affected individual over 10, uh, 12 years of time between right and left eye and you can see the macular atrophy is uh, variable like at 38 years of age the right eye doesn't have much atrophy but the left eyes show uh, a severe uh, atrophic macula which progress uh, much further uh, over 12 year time point. Details of these studies have been published last year in eLife so uh, just for the sake of time I'm just showing the representative data from that. When we uh, look at the visual field uh, in these affected individuals over ages, what we found is uh, uh, at, at in early teen age, they have pretty intact uh, visual field, which progressively decline. Similarly, their uh, visual equity is, is becoming uh, bad over time, declining over time. And while they are in like their 30s, uh, 20s or 30s, they have pretty intact retinal function. And when we plot this on a survival curve, what you can see is there's a rapid decline after maybe late 30s, early 40s, there's a rapid decline uh, in the visual field and visual equity. I should point out that our sample size is only 13 affected individuals. It's not very large, but yet it's a, a reasonable size to predict that there is a reasonable time uh, uh, of of window of opportunity, what I call is window of opportunity to intervene uh, uh, with therapeutic options and to protect the or attenuate the progression of uh, vision impairment in these affected individuals. So, uh, and, and now, uh, and with in collaboration, uh, Ashurva Neff Foundation in collaboration with FFB is actually doing more comprehensive uh, natural history study in patients with uh, Rush1F phenotype and the study uh, is enrolled as Rush1F in clinical trial and, and encourage uh, all of you to look at that study and consider participating if you know someone uh, segregating the variants in PCDH15. What we want to see is uh, if we can replicate this phenotype in a mouse model because we want to use those animal models then uh, for therapeutic intervention and eventually developing uh, therapies for human uh, subjects uh, uh, affected with PCDH15 variant. So what we did is we introduced the same mutation R245X in a mouse model and in the mouse this variant is R256X rather than 245 days. Uh, uh, the orthologue position is 250 rather than 245. And similar to other mouse model of PCDH15, these mice also have a uh, hearing deficit by birth. They have severe vestibular problem. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus today on the VN impairment in these mice. We assess their uh, VN function using a physiological assay called electroretinography, where you provide a, a light uh, stimulus and measure the uh, electric activity of the retina uh, using electrodes uh, put on the eye. Similar as we do in a human as well. And the electrical activity is uh, grouped into two different waveforms, A wave and B wave, and roughly the A wave is recording the uh, activity of the photoreceptor area, while the B wave is uh, uh, recording the activity of uh, second order neurons, bipolar cells, and downstream cells. Uh, in that. So when we looked at the A wave and B wave amplitudes in our PCDH15 control mice, shown here in black, uh, the amplitudes were uh, normal, both uh, the uh, scotopic A wave and scotopic B wave, which is like mirroring the activity in dark. 
as well as uh, the scotopic uh, photopic response which is made in the activity in light uh, we uh, and compared them in the age match mutant the pcdh15 homozygous mutant have significantly declined a wave b wave amplitude and as well as uh, photopic b wave amplitudes as early as p30 and then over time this uh, decline uh, this difference uh, persist and uh, the mutant mice have attenuated amplitude throughout their development and adult ages and even as old as 1 year old mice don't show uh, uh, show the attenuated ERG amplitude, both scotopic and photopic, suggesting that indeed the retina in these mice is not uh, functioning normally. However, we compared to human, we did not find any retinal degeneration in the mice on C57 black 6 background, which is not surprising because other uh, PCDH15 mutant mice and many of the other Usher 1 mice don't. Sh uh, uh, faithfully mimic the retinal degeneration phenotype uh, on the black six background. So the, what we looked at is uh, if there's no degeneration, why uh, the retina is not functioning well. And what we found is uh, two uh, main deficit. One, the proteins that are involved in the uh, light transduction, uh, transducing and arresting, their localization is dependent on the light and dark cycle and uh, normally the transducin in the light response is localized uh, move from inner segment to uh, uh, outer segment uh, and then uh, localizing the inner segment in the light while the arrestin is mainly localized in the outer segment in the presence of light but what we found is in pcdh15 this translocation is impaired and Transducin is present both in inner and outer segment and similarly the arrestin is also found both in outer segment and inner segment so it's not getting properly cycled between the two parts of the photoreceptor cells. What we also found is that retinoids uh, or retinoid exozymes that uh, these are the uh, enzymes that are uh, uh, these are the molecules that are involved in uh, the generation of rhodopsin so they go from photoreceptor to rpe and there is a cycle that uh, generates the uh, pigment uh, for the retinal levens is retinal to bind with the opsin to generate rhodopsin and the rhodopsins then sense the uh, light so when we looked at the level of uh, these uh, retinal exozyme in mice as well as looked at the enzymes uh, like RP65, IRBP and other enzymes involved in the synthesis of this uh, 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 retinal exozyme, what we found is in PCDH15 homozygous mice compared to the heterozygous mice, their level, the enzymes involved in the synthesis were significantly reduced as well as the retinal exozymes level were significantly reduced, which may be the reason these mice show deficit in their ERG amplitudes. So uh, uh, briefly, if we summarize what we found is retinoid uh, cycle protein as well as retinoid species are reduced uh, in these mutant mice. Uh, in, and they also have reduced ERG amplitudes and they have mislocalization of arrestin transducin. So that led us to hypothesize that if indeed these uh, retinal retinoid species and the enzyme deficit is contributing to the ERG amplitudes decline, what if we provide exogenous retinoid, will that rescue the ERG deficits in the mutant mice? So the idea is you just give exogenous 9 cis retinol and that should go that will bypass the uh, contribution of rpe epithelium and provide the retinoid retinol to the photoreceptor and whether they are able to synthesize enough rhodopsin to recover the erg function so for this assay uh, we gave uh, a single injection of uh, 9 cis retinol intraperitoneally like in the belly of the mouse and uh, recorded the ERG amplitude 24 hours late, uh, later and what we found is compared to the homozygous mutant the mice that are getting the injection of 9 cis retinol their ERG amplitude significantly improved from the mutant mice and they were comparable to the control mice uh, whether this rescue 
can be done only in the early age or later ages we tested even the older mice six to seven uh, months old mice uh, they also showed uh, improvement in the erg amplitude by single injection of uh, retinoid so the next question was whether this uh, rescue persists over time so for that we gave uh, injection and then measured the uh, erg amplitudes one day post injection one week post injection and two week post injection and what we found is uh, one day post injection or, and even one week post injection the amplitudes are uh, improved uh, or rescued but oh, by two weeks of uh, uh, injection the ERG amplitudes start declining again uh, suggesting that this single injection is sufficient maybe for recovery for one week plus but not up to 14 days however there is a caveat we the nine cis retinol we can use in uh, animal model studies but we cannot use it in human uh, for many reasons and uh, good thing is there is a nine cis retinol acetate which uh, called QLT091001 or zuretinol uh, and uh, it has shown for other diseases not for usher syndrome that it has uh, no gross effect and it shows uh, significantly improved uh, RP, uh, ERG amplitudes in patients with uh, that uh, RP65 deficits or uh, disease called labeled congenital amaurosis. So now uh, w what we are doing is uh, in collaboration with the company that have these compound whether we can access those compound and test them in our model mouse model first and eventually design a human clinical trial for usher 1f subjects with the hypothesis that similar to the mouse model this compound will improve the vn function in usher 1f subjects as an alternate we are also working with professor uh, yegel's lab at uh, shiba institute uh, tel aviv uh, israel where they have synthetic 9 cis beta carotene uh, powder or compound and that powder uh, is also kind of a derivative for these retinoids and uh, our uh, question is whether if we give these compound to our animal model whether it will improve their erg function or not and the reason we picked up this compound because uh, the shiba institute they developed this high 9 cis beta carotene which is kind of a derivative of retinoids and used it in a uh, number of studies and what they have shown in patients with uh, retinitis pigmentosa if you give this uh, 9 cis beta carotene rich powder it improves the uh, ERG function in patients with uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So in collaboration with Professor Yagal and team, uh, we are now uh, going to test this compound in our mouse model first uh, and then in human subjects uh, clinical trial to see if we can indeed improve the ERG function in these uh, uh, subjects. So if I summarize quickly here what we found in our uh, longitudinal phenotyping study that the human subjects with usher one f or uh, variants have progressive retinal degeneration similar to other usher one f however the uh, the progression is relatively slow and you see severe macular atrophy by the sixth decade of life uh, and half of the patients we tested in our uh, study were legally blind by their mid 50s so suggesting that we, we have a reasonable time maybe uh, until they are in their 30s to intervene with uh, therapeutic options to correct their vn function or to slow down the progression of vn impairment similar to the human uh, subjects our mice also have a vn deficit uh, measured by the ergs and these mice have deficits in the ret retinoid cycle protein as well as retinoid exozymes uh, 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 9 cis uh, 11 cis retinal esterase uh, levels were reduced and we also showed that uh, administration of ex exogenous 9 cis retinal can improve the erg function in the mouse model of our uh, uh, usher 1f so, uh, lead suggesting a potential therapeutic approach that may be that we may able to use in human to preserve their uh, vn function 
with that, I would like to thank all the people who actually uh, generated the data and gave me an uh, option to present, uh, especially Samuel Sethana. He was a postdoc and now he's a lead scientist in Jensen & Jensen. Uh, Seher Riaz, a graduate student, worked uh, actively with Samuel on this project. Arno Gizi phenotyped the year part of the as my collaborator from NEI, Wadizen, and Tom Friedman, particularly for the human natural history study and my own going collaboration in Shiba Institute with uh, Ifeth and Dr. Yagel, uh, Professor Yagel, uh, looking at the beta-carotene dye. The special thank to Asha One F Collaborative for all the funding uh, to support the project in my lab as and the natural history project was supported by NIE and IDCD internal funding to what is an Tom Friedman. Thank you so much and I will be happy to take any question.